Hello and welcome to Biblical Justice A to X. If you're joining us in the live audience, please be sure to turn off your other computer programs for the best audiovisual experience. Global Justice is pleased to present to you Biblical Justice A to X, a monthly video series that considers a range of justice issues from abortion to xenophobia. This month, in our last session in the series, we will be discussing this important topic of xenophobia. My name is Sosma Samuel Burnett, and I serve as the founder and president of Global Justice, and I'm pleased to serve as moderator for this session. I'm also pleased to be joined with our two panelists for today's discussion, Matt Moustakas and Sammy Kaufman. Welcome, Matt, and welcome, Sammy. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you both here. Now, we have much to discuss on this topic of xenophobia, and we'll be sure to explain to our audience a little bit about what this topic is. But before we do, Matt, would you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work and context? Yeah. Um, so I am a middle school special education teacher here in the Sacramento area. I teach at a Title I school at a full inclusion school. So that means it's not your uh, typical day class where every student goes to. Instead, it's I push into all the classes and I pull kids out of those classes. Um, so I have I work with a wide range of population uh, populations, um, predominantly Hispanic and African American. Though. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Matt. And also, Sammy, would you give us a little introduction of your context and work? Uh, I teach grade three at an international school in Saudi Arabia. It basically serves the um, population of employees for a huge oil company called Saudi Aramco. They've been mm -hmm. popping up in the news a bit lately, actually. Uh, so our school uh, cares for all of the students in, in the employment of this oil company. Um, my class is very diverse. We have 18 different countries represented in my one little classroom, and, um, 42 in our school. So it's a, it's a pretty special and diverse location, uh, kind of mixed into Saudi Arabian culture, which is also a very fascinating experience as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you both for sharing that. You know, two of the reasons that we really wanted to have the two of you share on this topic is because of this educator quality that you have. You're both there in education, working with the next generation, but then you're also working in these very multicultural environments. And I think that's a great reference for our topic. For our audience to understand, this idea of xenophobia is not a term that's often um, heard or understood by people. And really what it means is it's a fear of the other. And typically what we're talking about is a very intense fear of people from other countries or other cultures. So I kind of want to start there. And maybe Sam, we'll start with you. When you think of this term xenophobia, whether on a personal basis or on a professional basis, what does that mean to you? What is the what is this concern? Well, I like to pride myself, I guess, as someone who has constantly been interested in other cultures since the time I was a little girl. And uh, life has brought me through many different experiences in different countries. And ultimately, we kind of landed in this location that's a really hot topic right now. And um, so for me currently, thinking about xenophobia is often connected to um, Islamophobia or fear of Middle Easterners. And that's something that I face probably on a daily basis, whether it's, you know, questions from families and friends over social media, um, possibly fear for us and our location. Uh, we were in Egypt prior to this during the Arab Spring. And so we saw a lot of that response. Um, so for me, I, I see a lot of that. Uh, the contrast to it, though, is kind of this beautiful little world within my classroom where we have students from five different religions and, as I mentioned, 18 different countries speaking many different languages, and they all interact in this beautiful cross-cultural awareness that's really hard to build in many other locations. And so um, it's, it's an interesting contrast to see uh, that often people's questions or worries are rooted in fear. And then to see kind of the naivety of children where they aren't aware of the fear and they live in this beautiful community. So it's, um, I don't know if that answered the question, but it's a beautiful contrast actually. <laughs> Well, and interesting that, you know, children seem to not have that fear, and it's really adults that seem to develop that fear. And we're going to talk a little bit more in a moment about what might be the roots of that. Uh, Matt, same question for you. So, you know, you're in this very multicultural setting as well. Um, tell me what you think, either on a personal and or professional basis, about this topic of xenophobia. What does it mean to you? Um, xenophobia. 
Right. In my school, it's we talk about these kind of topics all, all the time. We push the, the cultural aspect of it. Everyone is different. Everyone has a race. Everyone has their own needs. We talk a lot about needs, and especially as a special educator, we talk a lot about the different needs and different people. Um, in my job, uh, I come across coming across all these different races. Um, it's the difference is uh, like I go and I go to these kids, and these kids will come and see me, and they'll see me as this different different color, different colored skin. They'll refuse to work with me. They'll refuse to say this guy has white privilege. This guy, this guy is white, and this guy will tell me I'm racist. And all you know, because I have an opportunity to go into different classes and work with these kids. And they'll refuse. They'll refuse my services because of the color of my skin. Um, and so that's kind of like my context for this. I, I, that's what I. That's what I think of. Um, my color of my skin will in, hinder me from working with the kids, and that's my job is to help them um, to catch up to grade level and to help them with whatever they're they're working on. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting. And, you know, I think that highlights the fact that xenophobia can come from lots of different directions, you know, depending on your context uh, and who you're interacting with. Xenophobia can come across, you know, whether it's against Middle Easterners, as you mentioned, Sammy, or even against someone that is a, a white background, whatever that background may be. In, in the case of Matt, you know, he's coming from a Mediterranean background. But let me talk a little bit about why this topic is a justice topic. And as we have talked about, this series is Biblical Justice A to X. So why is this a biblical justice concern? Matt, maybe I'll start with you on this question. It's a biblical justice concern because God loves all his people. Um, when I go into these environments, you know, I go into the mindset like God loves these people. God loves this child and I need to love on this child as he loves this child. You know, when we go into the realm of um, I'm not willing to work with this person because of their race, because I'm not really sure about them. And that's when we, you know, we don't get to sh uh, share the gospel or spread the news. And, you know, I had so many good opportunities to share, you know, the good news of you know Jesus and what he's done because of the way I've walked. And people have asked me, why? Why? Why do you care so much? Why? You know, how do you stay so positive? How are you so, you know, joyful as you're working with me when, I go and I tell you racist things or I, I beat you down and it's presented this great opportunity to, uh, to love on them and to share the, share, share the word. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Matt. And then Sammy, same question. So why would you consider this topic such a biblical justice concern? Well, we found ourselves in this context where we actually aren't really part of a Christian context. And so I think, exiting William Jessup and then going, you know, into Northern California church community and then eventually leaving that community uh, left us floundering a little bit for our role in, in this world and what that looks like. And um, so we also work in a company and in a country where we're not permitted to mention our Christianity. And uh, literally we lived in a, we live in a closed country, uh, headquarters of Islamic state. And so it's, it's an interesting place that we display and share our love for humanity in, in a very quiet um, and professional way, I believe. But I think that what it comes down to is, as Matt shared, that God deeply values and loves all people. And the way in which people express that is so unique and diverse to the world over. I used to have this picture in my mind for um, what belief in God looked like, um, deep family values or or possibly even thinking that as you know a middle class american christian that we had some sort of window into what that looked like and moving overseas and meeting um, coptic christians in egypt and believers all over the world mm -hmm. to people who are truly searching uh has really popped that bubble for us and what that looks like and so mm -hmm. I think the first step to sharing God's great love is deeply understanding a person and who they are and why they believe what they believe. And that is so ingrained in their roots and where they come from. And so mm -hmm. opening that up to value that is the greatest gift, which is the exact opposite of xenophobia, deeply seeking to understand a person and their culture. 
Absolutely. And, you know, and let me follow up with both of you on this idea of, of the roots of this. You know, you both have mentioned that you've experienced xenophobia or seen it in various forms against various people. But let's talk about where this comes from. You know, why why do people develop these sort of deep seated fears uh, about someone just because they are of a different race or culture or country? Um, I'll start with you, Sammy, on this one. What do you think are the roots of this fear, irrational or otherwise? Well, I think starting from the context of being an American, uh, looking back not too deep into history, we've seen this path of xenophobia and it kind of changes over about every generation for the people group that we're fearing. And, and often it's rooted in um, possibly uh, media, uh, world events, political events, and all these things that are kind of altering our perspectives of people. But what I found is um, that when we actually know people, that fear is erased. And so even, as I mentioned before, priding myself in someone who values interculturalism or cross-culturalism, uh, moving to Egypt in the middle of the Arab Spring, there were people that I quote unquote felt safe with and people that I didn't. And it was for no other reason than how they looked. And boy, was my bubble popped when I met deeply powerful, beautiful, um, faith pursuing, uh, people living in a context which terrified me at first and um, bumping into a guy in the airport who's wearing a, a turban he's Sikh and watching him get a lot of attention through security where I walk through without a question and things like that so you start noticing it and it and it really is rooted in fear so um, my encouragement always is especially when we we get asked a lot about the um, Islam question and Middle Easterners whom are the majority of our friends now, uh, we get asked that question a lot. And I always encourage people to go out and meet someone, become a friend, and, and it causes that fear to go away pretty quickly. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned the Sikh example. I remember myself, um, you know, post 9-11, where, you know, there was a location where, you know, up in Northern California, where many Sikhs lived, and people didn't understand them as Sikhs, and assumed that they were Middle Easterners, and, you know, all, already had a fear of Middle Easterners. So now that transfers to yet another people group because of this misunderstanding of culture and reference. So, you know, very interesting examples. Matt, same question for you. What do you think are these roots of these fears, you know, these deep seated um, you know, perhaps irrational, but still fears that people have about different cultures, races, uh, and countries. Yeah, just like Sammy said, I, it's a lack of interaction. Um, I know from working with the kids I work with, you know, once you start interacting with them, once they start talking with others, it seems the, the fears and the, the, their biases go away. I know from a couple of my kids on my caseload um, who who in the beginning refused or just didn't want to work with me um, and, you know, call me racist or white privileged or what it may, may be, you know, over time, you know, with working with them consistently, those kind of fears went away. Mm -hmm. um, so I, especially in my community, you know, that I work in, it's predominantly black and Hispanic. And so um, there may not be a lot of interaction with uh, the different, different cultures, different people groups and, and those kinds of things. So I think with one, we start doing that when they start interacting, those those fears and will go away. Yes, absolutely. And let me just follow up on that. When we talk about, you know, these um, fears and, and then when we talk about how to address the fears, both of you mentioned, you know, it's getting to know people. How do we do that, Matt? Like, how, how is that possible? Is it by integrating people in communities? Uh, is it just by giving them opportunities to be with people from other places? How do we begin to, to do that? Um, from my perspective, it's, you know, it's not backing away from the, the, the table. It's not leaving the table and, you know, going at it. Um, you know, just the other day, I had an interaction with a gentleman and, you know, uh, calling me racist things. And I, you know, instead of leaving the table, I, you know, pursued the table in love, you know, and I, you know, I, you know, I pursued the conversation. Um, and I think so many of my kids that I work with leave the table. And so just getting people to stay there and stay in the conversation, you know, uh, to kind of get over that hump of, you know, uh, un not feeling good or, you know, uncomfortability and kind of getting over that. I don't know how um, you know, to make people sit at the table, but, you know, I think that's what will need to happen. 
Great, thank you. It's a question. You're in a very unique situation, unique location, unique unique context, uh, and maybe in many ways different than your own context and your own beliefs. How do you suggest people um, start to get to know each other and you know and, and and get rid of these fears? Well, again, I think it starts with that building of community, and as Matt mentioned, your ability to be comfortable being pushed outside of those comfort zones. And uh, one example I have, we um, have all these different interest groups on our little compound. And one of them is this Arabic ladies group. And I've never been invited because I'm not an Arabic lady, but uh, a couple of our friends made the connection and we all went and got together and had this ridiculous dance party and this fabulous mm -hmm. time. But it's the same group of ladies that are wearing the full black hijabs and kind of addressing my comfort zone where before, I don't feel that I ever really judged them, but I had a perception of who they were underneath all of that cloth. And uh, I remember just my mind being blown when we walked in this room and it was just ladies and the scarves had come off and everybody was uh, sitting together just talking as moms and wives and friends in this community. And you realize that we are really not so very different from one another. And we all hope to be uh, kind people. We hope to build beautiful families. Um, these ladies were struggling and excited to learn English, and I'm floundering through Arabic. And we just found this beautiful connection together. And so, you know, that was really just a few months ago. And this is my fifth year living in the Middle East. And so, I, even in that moment, still being, you know, still allowing my bubble to be popped and, and addressing those preconceived notions about who people are. And I think it goes the same way where these ladies were literally wearing a physical veil over who they are underneath. But I think that we do that a lot with skin deep as well. And um, whether it's the color of our skin or locations or whatnot, but the key I think is always to get to know people and ask those naive questions and dig a little deeper and you're gonna find out uh, that there's some really beautiful people in the world. <laughs> Oh, that's great. And, you know, I want to also expand our conversation a little bit. You know, you've been using your reference points as it makes sense to do so about this topic, how it affected you personally, professionally. But let's talk about this topic of xenophobia in, in a broader context. It happens in our local communities. Uh, it happens nationally. And it does happen internationally. And so maybe I can start with you, Matt. You know, when you think about the local, the national, international, is there some topic or related topics that make you really think, you know, this is an issue because of these topics? And, and how can we discuss that? So locally, you know, I like to start with a story. Um, I was at the grocery store last week and a half ago, and I was just doing my rounds, walking up and down the aisles and came and made eye contact with a gentleman and I said, hello. And then he kind of turned away and kind of frowned at me and I'm like, oh, maybe he's just having a bad day. And then he continued to push his, his uh, little daughter down the aisle. I uh, didn't think anything of it. And I kept walking, kept walking. And then I heard uh, someone start yelling. And I was like, do you work here? And uh, I'm like, oh, no, no, I guess you're talking to me. But no, I know I don't work here. And then the guy started berating me and telling me, you know, that I needed to back off. And that and started yelling at the other customers in line that I, this is racism in action. And that I am the white example of white privilege. And I, I was like, whoa, what is this coming from? And so I, you know, I stepped in, stepped closer and said, talk to me. It's like, what's going on? And the guy refused and just threatened to beat me up. And um, I had no idea what, where he was coming from. And so, um, you know, this is an example that I've come across. And, you know, the reason it was so striking because a lot of the things that he was saying was exact words that my students say to me. And mm -hmm. their mannerisms, the way they say it and the words that they say or the exact same things that my students have said to me. Um, so it's definitely like once my students leave, you know, if it doesn't get addressed, they turn into this. And it's very grieving, you know, to, to live in that fear, to live that way to re, where you think people are out to get you or you're, you know, you're kind of have to watch your back. 
Well, and let's try to extrapolate that out. You know, if we're talking about an individual example that has affected you, but you know, let's look at what why is that happening in our communities? I mean, is it because race relations in, in, in America has become very tense and very difficult and there's been a lot of misunderstandings on, on all sides? And I think what happens is, you know, within let's say the white community, there may not be a, an understanding necessarily of the impact of you know the historical and even maybe current um, issues that are faced by people of color. And then similarly, maybe people of color are not understanding that not every white person uh, necessarily carries those biases or, you know, is implementing those biases. Um, and that's a challenge, you know, to kind of, you know, put a, a label on everybody because of certain things that have happened. So that might be part of the explanation. Um, Sammy, you know, just, you know, in your context, you know, when we're talking now globally, um, do you see elements of what we're talking about locally on, the, on, on a more global level, especially in other regions besides where you are? Well, I feel like we're in a really unique season as a country, and um, it's fascinating and disheartening, I would say, to watch kind of from afar what our home country is going through, and um, also just to see the waves of that kind of ripple through the global community. And mm -hmm. I think we're in uh, an especially unique season uh, as believers to help bridge some of those gaps. And um, you know, I think we've definitely um, had many conversations with uh, the ex expatriate community, people coming from all over the world about about these issues going on in the United States. Uh, I think, you know, not opening a huge can of worms, <laughs> try not to put my foot in it, but I, I do feel like for the first time as an American, it's been sad to be in the global community where people worry about who I am as an American and what I represent. And uh, sometimes those philosophies and political beliefs are all getting meshed into one big bucket, I think. And, um, and it leads to conversations like what Matt is having and uh, people assuming rather than asking questions. And so I think we're in this spot, this tipping point where we could potentially turn the conversations towards a greater understanding of one another I feel like it also has given uh, a freedom for people to act and to treat others in ways that we had never felt appropriate before. So I think it can go go either way, which is uh, concerning. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, and you both have raised, you know, different topics of concern. I'm going to throw in a couple of more uh, that I know that you, you've touched on as well. So right now we're in a context where we have, you know, uh, global terrorism. And uh, as a result of global terrorism, there's all sorts of different xenophobic uh, outcroppings of that. Um, we've also had a major refugee crisis that has been global as well, and that's affected many parts of our world. Um, how do you see these kinds of sort of international concerns and then this resulting xenophobia? How do you see this and how do you see this playing out? Maybe uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Sammy, this time and connect with Matt after. Well, I think it comes down to when we lump a person or a people group into a group and uh, that's one of the questions that we face often is, oh, all, all Muslims are terrorists. And my first response is, well, which Muslims do you know? And so oftentimes people aren't sure what that looks like. Um, I think that statistically there's some alarming concerns. We went to a holiday in, uh, in Munich this Christmas before flying home. And admittedly, I felt more nervous in a Christmas market than I've ever felt in my life, wondering if this could possibly cause fear. And mm -hmm. so even as someone who is immersed in a culture and I know better and I know people, I still found myself ill at ease sometimes. And unfortunately, when you're in a context where you don't know every person surrounding you and you have that fear ingrained from real experiences that have happened, I think it's almost easier to give ourselves permission to judge others or to be fearful. And right. so I, I think we, we see that a lot more. Right, Matt, same question. I mean, you know, these international topics have affected your region. You know, the Sacramento region has been deeply affected by things like the refugee crisis. Um, so how do you see that playing out in that community? Yeah, actually um, a lot of my a couple students at my own school and a lot of my cohort have actually had a lot of in, big influx of refugees at their school. Uh, in my school per se, I haven't really seen it 
a big problem I really love. Um, the refugee kids, actually, there are a couple of Christian kids, super mm -hmm. sweet, no problems. But a couple of my cohort, um, they've had a difficult time interacting, language barriers, um, mm -hmm. a lot of strife between students and staff, um, just some difficulties reaching them. Um, just, I don't know, culturally, there's, there's some insensitivity there. There's definitely a large amount of fear, um, not refusing to be worked with. Um, mm -hmm. because of mistrust and they'll tell you know my coworkers said that they mistrust them they said i don't trust you mm -hmm. i mean i refuse to be worked with um mm -hmm. you know and then amongst the other slurs and you know demeaning terms but you know it's there's a lot of them and there's a lot of it, it's a crazy problem with language barriers um and you know, being able to teach to that mm. well let me and pick up on that matt maybe as a you know as a not a wrap-up question, but just more of a, a statement. Education is a key element, you know, when you're talking about understanding and developing. And, and many of the reasons why we want to have this conversation with the two of you is your educator in these very multicultural contexts. So as an educator, Matt, how do you see education playing a critical role in helping to overcome xenophobia? Absolutely. It plays a huge role. You know, we, you know, schools have huge influences over children and what they believe. And uh, right now there's a huge push for the whole, whole multiculturalism piece. And, you know, everyone has their own specific needs and specific wants, and we need to be able to teach to that. Um, and so, you know, it kind of applies that that can be carried over into this situation where we teach, you know, it's like, you know, these are where these kids come from and these are what their needs are, you know, and kind of like understanding, understanding their backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and so it can definitely be applied and they have a huge role over it. Um, the other side of the coin is where it can be misapplied uh, if, you know, everyone is about differences and differences and differences and there's no room for unity. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only concern that I have seen is that everyone is different, but we can't come together. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no place to be unified over. You know, there's such a focus on our differences, but there's no focus on and how our differences can be unified. That's a great point, that we need to educate on these distinctions, but also have the commonalities. You know, we are all human beings. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Sammy, same question. You're an educator in an international context. How do you see education as being a key player in you know, addressing this issue of xenophobia? Well, I think speaking um, as a teacher and as a mother, uh, one of the greatest things that I think we can give our kids is this sense of global citizenship. And uh, I think that that's a, a really difficult thing sometimes. Uh, I think it causes us to fear that we're disloyal to our patriotism or something like that. But I think as believers, uh, understanding that we are global citizens, that we're part of the human race and that each person has a very unique and special role within that. And that's one of the, the highlights of my teaching career is to build that within students, to honor and to deeply value each human being for who they are and where they come from. And that rooted in that love permits us the opportunity to build friendships and, and share that their unique experiences are precious and special to who they are. And uh, the beauty behind it is selfishly, I get a lot of uh, positive returns on it as well, where we get to experience the beauty of all sorts of people and uh, it's a give and a take. So I think teaching kids to be global citizens and to have their eyes open for opportunity is uh, one of the greatest gifts we can give them. Absolutely, and I, I think to a large extent that really resonates with the Great Commission, doesn't it? You know, um, you know, Jesus called on us to go forth and make disciples of all nations. So that isn't limited to the United States or the Middle East or anywhere else. And on top of that, we're also told to teach all that he has taught us. And so as educators, I want to thank you both for doing that and to sharing uh, to share Christ, you know, directly or indirectly by your examples. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left and I want to give each of you an opportunity to give us a little bit of a slice of something that you're excited about or something that you're presently working on um, that you'd like our audience to know about. So Matt, I'll start with you. Um, is there something that you'd like to share about your work that you'd like to get our audience to know about? Sure, you know, I, I love working with the kids in our school, you know, my school district and the population that I work with, you know, there's a huge need for it. There's a huge need for, you know, um, people who are willing to invest themselves in, in these areas and willing to go above and beyond and to love on these kids. 
even when it's difficult. There's such a, a high attrition rate in this, in these, uh, I've already lost countless, you know, staff in this area because it's a difficult area, you know, and so if people are, you know, willing to stick it out to love on these kids despite when they're beat down, this is a good field for you. Um, you know, I love it. I'm thankful that God has placed me here and he's such a good learning opportunity and challenges me every day. Am I willing to love on this kid, even when he is mean as heck to me right now, you know, and so it's challenging, challenges the way I, you know, I follow Christ. So, well, yeah. thank you for, for your commitment to those young people, and even in these difficult circumstances. And Sammy, same question for you. You know, is there a highlight that you'd like to share from your work or your family that uh, you'd like to share with our audience? Well, one of the things that I've been trying out uh, new to our time in Saudi Arabia, just because we're so limited and um, kind of cut off from the world in a lot of ways, but I've been reaching out to a lot of different authors and um, professionals to Skype in with our our students. And we've been doing um, about four different video chats with um, famous children's authors. Uh, recently, we had a coder who works for Facebook and um, a professional ballerina and all these different characters um, Skyping in and messaging with the children. And I just have to say, watching their eyes open wide to the world and understanding that opportunity is bigger than gender or privilege or experience, um, language, culture, and all of those things. It brings a, a really beautiful unity to the kids and seeing that the world is, is um, rooting for them, actually. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's wonderful to be a communicator that we are champions for their cause wherever they are and, and, and whatever they're pursuing. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew Moustakis and Sammy Kaufman for spending your time with us. Thank you for all the great work that you're doing in education. Um, and thank you for talking about this important topic of xenophobia. And to our audience, we also thank you for joining us. And if you'd like to, you can also join us online um, when we'll be sharing the recording of this session along with the study guide with further questions to give you a chance to continue the conversation. I hope you'll have a wonderful and happy new year.